Good. All right. In here, we're going to get into today's message. Um, I'm going to ask the question I always ask when I start a message. What book have we been going through? <laughs> Judah? Joshua. Joshua. Yes, Joshua. You're becoming a And yeah. who? No, take no notice. I, I, will, I will take no notice. So Joshua. And he's been very busy. He's been conquering a lot of land, if you hadn't noticed. Um, but we're going to read chapter 13, verse 1 initially, um, and then we will see where we go from there. So this is what it says. It says, When Joshua was an old man, the Lord said to him, You are growing old, and much land remains to be conquered. And so that's a very interesting verse. Um, but before I go further, I will pray and then get into the message. Father, thank you so much for your holy word. Thank you that it's a light, it's a lamp unto our feet, a guide for our path. And we thank you that your word is truth. Everything you say is true and necessary for our edification. And so, Father, I pray that we would have ears to hear what you are saying to us this morning. Father, help our hearts to be those hearts that when the word is sown, it brings forth fruit 100-fold in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So Joshua was getting old, and all of us get old and older, and that has physical consequences. And so the point here seems to be that, look, you're getting old, and there's a lot to do, and you're too old to do it. Um, you can't be leading Israel into battle much longer. There's, but the problem is there's still a lot of land that needs to be conquered. And so that was the uh, dilemma here. And so what was Joshua to do? Was he to just sit back and do absolutely nothing? Well, in the following verses, um, what happens is God specifies to Joshua the lands that remains to be conquered. And he tells them the areas. And then in verses 6 and 7, God says to Joshua, I myself will drive these people out of the land ahead of the Israelites. So be sure to give this land to Israel as a special possession, just as I have commanded you. Include all this territory, and that's the territory he just mentioned, as Israel's possession when you divide this land among the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so, yes, Joshua was not going to be able to lead them into battle um, in the way he did before, but he still had something that he was to do. He was to divide the land for them. In other words, he was to assign to each tribe the particular areas of the land that would be their portion. And he was to do that as their leader. And you'll notice it's the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. You might wonder, well, what about the rest of them? Well, Moses had already assigned for those other tribes their territory on the other side of the Jordan. And so now Joshua was to um, decide by lot how the, the land on this side of the Jordan would be set up for the Israelites, what would be their respective portions. And so here's the point. Joshua still had something to do. Everyone say, he still, he still had, something had something to do. And look, here's a life lesson. We should never allow our frustration with what we can't do to cause us to neglect what we can do. All right? Let's focus on what we can do. And this now goes beyond age, etc., because all of us have limitations, whether those limitations are imposed on us via various circumstances, various responsibilities, etc. Um, whatever the case might be, look, we can all do something. And listen, let me start with the foundational thing. Every one of us can pray. Amen. And prayer is not some empty ritual. It's a very important event in which business is done. Prayer actually makes a difference. It does something. I know what it is to be strengthened by your prayers. People have said, oh, you know, surprised that apparently I'm doing very well. But look, I've been prayed for. They make a difference. Isn't it amazing how sometimes we can pray for something, and then when the thing happens, we don't believe it's happened, even though we were praying for it. 
And that's what happened with Peter when he was in jail. The church, it says, was praying for him. And then when he was miraculously released, he shows up at the house, Mark's house, I believe, or Mark's mother, whichever one. He shows up there, and the lady who opens the door is in disbelief, and then she tells them, Peter's at the door, and they, they don't believe her. And, and they were praying. But there you go. Prayer is important. We must pray. We can all pray. You may say, well, I'm not very good at praying. That's all the more reason to pray. Practice makes perfect. The more you do something, the more confident you become at it. God hears your prayers. And please remember that. God hears your prayers. Um, and you may be needing to start prayer and saying, God, you know, like they did in the Psalms, hear me when I pray. But you say that and it helps set up your heart to know that you are being heard by God. Now, another life lesson taught here in this episode of Joshua is the importance of faith. Faith, you see, Joshua had to assign land that they hadn't yet conquered. So there was areas that they hadn't conquered, yet Joshua was to still assign those territories to the respective tribes. In other words, he assigned the land in faith, in faith, being certain, everyone say certain, certain, certain that God would do what he had promised to do and give them the land. You see, in Hebrews 11 verse 1 it says, now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Another translation puts the conviction of things not seen. Now, I want you to imagine the following scenario. Let's say you are somewhere and you've lost something. You can't remember where you found it, whether you're in your home or wherever else it might be. And you are looking around, you're looking here, there, you look in your bag, you look elsewhere, and you, you can't find this thing. And then someone who's been in, in the room with you for the whole time says to you, no, 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 I saw where you put it, you put it in your bag. Okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to look in your bag again. But this time, you're going to look with conviction. And I'm sure you've all been in the situation where you've looked for something in your bag and it's not there. And then you look again after you've looked everywhere else and you conclude it must be in your bag and behold, it's there. Now, if the person says to you, I saw where you put it, you put it in your bag. When you look in the bag again, you're going to look with conviction. There's a, there's a greater weight now to your looking because you've been told it's in there and so you're looking expecting to find it. You realize, oh, I must just not have seen it which is why you would do well if you wear glasses to have a nice colorful glasses case, orange, because if you put it in your bag and the inside is black, it will stick out. Wisdom. Now then, you will look with conviction. And that's what faith is. It's the conviction that what God says is true. It's the conviction that he will do what he said he will do. It is being certain of what we do not see. And so Joshua prepared for the future before it happened. Joseph in the Old Testament did the same thing. He said, look, when you enter the land, take my bones there. They hadn't entered the land yet. It wouldn't be a long time until they did. But he was confident that God would do what he said he would do. And that's faith. And so Joshua, here's what I want you to notice also, he prepared for the future because of his faith. He prepared for the future even though he himself was not going to be around to see it happen. And so we need to do the same thing. We need to prepare for the future because of our faith. You see, if Noah all those years ago didn't prepare for the future by building an ark, none of us would actually even be here this morning because we all descend from him. And because he built the ark, his household was saved. And in Hebrews 11 verse 7 we read, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that have never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So God warned Noah about the future. And God has warned each one of us 
about the future through his holy word, namely the Bible. And before I get on to what I'm about to get on to, none of us should be surprised at what we see happening in the world. In fact, listen, when we see the world in the mess that it is in, it should increase our faith. Because God already told us that in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous, that's a serious word. Very serious. Um, troubling times. Dangerous times. The love of many will wax cold, Jesus said. I think that was the old King James Version there. Wax cold. But um, for whatever reason, that era of English is the easiest to memorize. It's um, English at its peak. Elizabethan English. But look, Jesus said, the love of many will grow cold. It will grow cold. And Paul told us, look, people will be lovers of themselves. He said, listen, they will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. You see, and we see that even amongst Christians. We have a very casual Christianity um, where people have a form of godliness. They do the externals, they sing, they maybe come to church or whatever, um, but they deny the life-transforming power that the gospel brings to liberate us from the power of sin, to liberate us from bondage to ourself and to connect us with God and to allow us to walk with God. You've heard me say many a time um, what the problem with humanity is and how it goes all the way back to the garden and it's a very fascinating thing that happened because Adam and Eve were in the garden, God had put them there. And what really was going on there in that account of the fall of humanity, it was actually a preview of what would happen to Israel. And as far as I can tell, it would seem that it was in part at least to explain to Israel who were in exile by the time um, that Torah would have reached its final canonical form. They would have been in exile at that point and it's explaining to them why they have ended up in the mess they've ended up in, where they're far from their land and they're in bondage. And you see, look, what, what does that story tell us? It tells us that God put the man in the garden he gave him a law, it was a beautiful garden, he gave him a law, he broke the law that said don't eat from that forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from it. And because they, him and Eve transgressed God's commandment, what happened? He expelled them from the garden. And that's exactly Israel's history. He put them in a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. He gave them his law at Sinai. They broke his law, and so he expelled them from the land. And that's where they found themselves many years later in exile. But God is good, and his word is a light for our path. And he is able to restore us and bring us back. And that's what he promised to do to Israel. But what was the temptation that the devil offered Adam and Eve? Well, God had said, listen, don't eat from this tree. He didn't tell them why, but he told them the consequence if they did. He said, the day you eat of it, you will die. Don't eat it. But he never told them why, and this is important, because God will not always tell us why we're not to do something. Faith is not just trusting God despite not seeing him. It is also trusting God despite not always understanding what he is doing. He wants us to trust him. And so he didn't tell them why. But the devil comes in. And what he seeks to do is to fill the gaps in your knowledge with his own input. God hasn't told them why, and so he seeks to exploit that. But the thing was a matter of faith. Will they trust God or will they not? And that's the question we all must ask ourselves and challenge ourselves with in various situations in life. Will we trust God or will we not? I know God has told me to do this. I don't understand why or what's going on. Will I trust him or will I begin to satisfy my flesh by doing something else that I understand? Because that's what the flesh likes. The flesh does not like faith. 
It amazes me that in Joshua's farewell address to the nation, he would tell them, don't serve their gods, their gods, their idols. And it's a bizarre thing to say. After God had given them all those victories, why would they be tempted to serve the gods of the nations they defeated? Well, here's the temptation. Those gods, those idols, were gods that they could see. They could touch them, they could feel them, they could see them. And that's always the temptation. The devil wants to bring us down to that level, away from trusting in the invisible God. He wants us to serve things that we can see and that we can understand. But listen, if we could fully understand God, he's not God. It's incredibly silly to think that God must do things we understand. Let's us always have that reality check and remember how tiny we are. We live on this very small planet. It may feel big to us, but it's incredibly small. And in this um, galaxy in which we live, the Milky Way, we are so small. We can't, I couldn't, if I took this whole room and put a speck of dust somewhere, that would be too big to show the Earth next to our galaxy. We can't imagine it. It's too big. The nearest star is the sun. And that takes, to us, is the sun. And that takes 21 years to get to, um, if you go by plane. So you'll look a bit different if you went there and came back. Um, I look different. I went there once. And <laughs> The vitamin D I received, it was, just gave me this great youthful appearance. And here I am today. But look, that's the nearest star. But the next nearest star, it's something like 51 billion years or something crazy it would take to get there. And that's just within our galaxy. And within our galaxies are billions, I think, of other stars. So our galaxy is just ridiculously large already. And then our galaxy is only just one galaxy of billions of others. Now try and imagine your tiny brain in our galaxy. You can't even imagine it. It's too tiny. It's too irrelevant almost. And we think we can have the audacity to say God must do things I understand? How ridiculous. We need to trust God in fact, the Bible says his ways are past finding out. Past finding out. We cannot figure out God. But they were tempted. Adam and Eve, they were tempted. They were tempted with the wisdom that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would offer them. Now, the devil said to them, look, you're not going to die if you eat from that tree. And he was here speaking to Eve but when he said you to Eve in Hebrew, that word you is in the plural, not the singular. In English, we don't have that. We have the word you, and I can say, how are you speaking to one person to Polly, or I can say, how are you speaking to all of you? But in Hebrew, you have a singular you, and you have a plural you. And the word the devil used there is in the plural form. So when he said to Eve, God knows that you will be like him, knowing good and evil, he used the plural use, and not just you, Eve, you and Adam will be that way. So was she thinking not just about herself, but hey, her, her husband also would be wise um, with this knowledge of good and evil. And here's what the devil said. He said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What a thing to say. So before that, Adam and Eve basically enjoyed this state of innocence. They were naked and not ashamed. They were innocent. They had no concept of good and evil. All they knew is that they weren't to eat from that tree. And so the question could be asked, well, why didn't God want them to have that knowledge of good and evil? Because God himself had it. Because he himself said after they ate of the tree, now man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And they, he said, listen, lest he eat of the tree of life and live forever, let's get him out of the garden. So why didn't God want Adam and Eve to have that knowledge of good and evil? And instead to stay in that innocent state instead. Well, here's the thing. God can have the knowledge of good and evil and not be tempted by it. He's not tempted by evil, though he knows it. 
Whereas we humans, when we are tempted by evil, guess what we want to do? The evil. When we have the knowledge of good and evil, when we know evil, we want to do evil. We're tempted by the evil. And I know this, you know it too. I remember when I was a child, in the particular room my mum was ironing, she said, don't touch the iron. And what did I do? Touched the iron when she went out. <laughs> it's quite ridiculous, isn't it? If I had just trusted, I wouldn't have felt the pain. But look, when we know evil, we can be tempted by it. But God cannot be tempted with evil. And we see the consequence of Adam and Eve eating of that tree. We're suffering today for that decision they made. Woman, pain, you have painful childbirth. And you have Eve to thank for that. Um, Richard's garden is very impressive. But you have Adam to thank for the weeds. <laughs> I was going to say other things as well. But, um, you know, they, they have a lot to answer for. But we're suffering the consequence of them not trusting God. And if we would just trust God, our lives would be all the more, the better. Now, here's what I want to say. And of course, I'm not saying that every mess we find ourselves in is... You know, I saw this post the other day, someone said, everything in our life is a consequence of the decisions we've made. And I get it, you know, kind of motivational talk, but when I hear that, I'm thinking, yeah, but what about the person born disabled? It's a very reckless thing to say. But anyway, let me not get into that. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is coming back. Joshua was told about the future. We've been told about the future. Joshua prepared for the future. Noah prepared for the future by building the ark. We need to prepare for the future fact of Jesus Christ coming back to judge this world. In Acts 17, 31, it says, For God has set a day for judging the world of justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. And so when God raised Jesus from the dead, that was a statement. This is the man that will return to judge the world. And he will judge it fairly and with justice. And in Matthew 24, 37 to 39, Jesus said, When the Son of Man returns, the Son of Man being himself, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. And then in verse 44, he said, You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Now, Jesus told a parable. I won't read it to you. But he told um, a parable in Matthew 25 about the kingdom of God. And he likened it unto ten bridesmaids. And they, had, in those days, had to be part of this ceremony in which they would need to use their lamps um, I think, for when the um, bridegroom was coming. And here's the thing. Five of them, he said, were foolish. The other five were wise. And the wise ones took enough oil for their lamps. But the five unwise didn't. And so when the cry was said that the bridegroom is coming, the five foolish ones who didn't bring enough oil asked the five wise ones, can you give us some of your oil? And the five wise ones said, no. No, we can't. Because then we won't have enough oil. And so the five foolish ones were not allowed in, and they lost out. Now, what is the point of that parable? Some people, we see with a parable, always ask yourself, what is the central point of this parable? What is it trying to tell us? And some people get it wrong and they misunderstand and try reading into it things they shouldn't read into it. And they start saying, oh, the oil there represents the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't. First of all, the type of oil that was used for anointing was not the oil you put in the normal lamp 
All right, but even so, it, that, it, that's, that's to miss the point of the parable entirely. The point of the parable is this. When the bridegroom comes, it will be too late to start getting ready. That's the point. You need to be ready all the time. You need to be ready now. In other words, when Jesus starts coming, you won't have time to get ready. You need to be ready right now. You need to live in such a way that if Jesus Christ were to come back, back now, you're fine. You see, if you were on a plane and it was about to start, you were in turbulence, would you have to start confessing this sin, that sin, the other sin? Or would you be like Stephen in the book of Acts? Receive my spirit as he's being stoned. Or would you be having to repent of this, that, the other? Are you ready to meet Jesus when he comes? How can we be ready? But before I mention that, let me just first of all emphasize why we need to be ready. Because it's a day of judgment. And you know, God doesn't show partiality. Again, I go ahead of myself in the book of Joshua, and I go on to that farewell speech of his. Because one thing he said to the Israelites is that, look, if you rebel against God, God will throw you out of this land. Now, what's going on there? Why did God permit the Israelites to conquer the land in the first place? Well, as we saw last time, it was because the people who lived there were wicked. So wicked, they were offering their sons, their children as sacrifices to Molech. And they were so wicked that God said, you know what, I'm going to expel them from the land. And he says that same thing to his people as well. Listen, if you muck around, if you misbehave, if you go into sin and rebel against me, I will do the same thing to you. God shows no partiality. So we must be ready. And I want to share in the remainder of this message four ways that we must get ready for Christ's coming. And the first is this. It won't surprise you, hopefully. Get rid of sin. Get rid of sin. Now watch this in Romans 2, 5 to 8. It says, For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now let me just say this. Listen, we like to hear God is love, and so he is. But please understand, God is also a God of wrath and anger. Don't get it twisted. Never try and make God or mold him into what you want him to be. He is who he is. Now it says a day of anger is coming. Now what a description for a day, a day of anger. If I was to speak about a day of fasting, that means that that day we're going to fast. There is a day reserved for God's anger. And he must be angry. If he were not angry, he would not be a just, loving God. He has to be angry. You get angry when you see certain things done to people, and you see how wicked people are. God is much more righteous than you or me. He gets angry. And there's a day set aside for his anger, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. It says he will judge everyone according to what they have done. So in other words, you won't be able to say, hey, but I attended JCC. I even listened to that strange preacher you sent us. That won't help you. You will be judged according to what you have done. It says he will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for who? themselves. So notice he didn't say for those who live for the devil. Well, of course, we shouldn't do that. But when we live for ourselves, instead of for God, we are rebelling against him. Because he created us to be his servants. 
But when we don't seek God, when we don't involve God in our decision-making in our lives, we're living for ourselves. He says, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. Sin. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. And then in Matthew 7, 22 to 23, Jesus said, on judgment day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You see, it's what we do that matters. And Jesus, when he spoke to those seven churches in the book of Revelation that were in the Roman province of Asia, he said, I know your works. He didn't say, I know your intentions. He didn't say, I know your heart. Of course, he does know that. He said, I know what you do. I know your works. We cannot live in sin and think that we will make it into God's kingdom when Jesus comes. Never deceive yourself into thinking that way. If you have a sin that you refuse to repent of, you are going to hell. And it's that simple. And I speak this way, obviously not for popularity. This is not the kind of talk that will, <laughs> you know, get people loving your preaching. I say it out of love because I don't want any of you on that day to be condemned. All of us, myself included, Paul himself said about himself, listen, he said, lest I also be disqualified, having preached to others. All of us are that close to sin all the time. We can all fall, we can all get it wrong, and so we need to be on God. And the moment, you see, they say it this way, keep a short account with God. The moment you realize you have Heard that you have done wrong, you confess that to God straight away, get that right, sincerely repent, and He forgives. But He does not tolerate Christians who habitually live in sin and continue in their sin thinking that they are right with God. It's simply not true. They're not. Now, Jesus told us another way that we need to be ready for His coming, and it's this be diligent with your gifts. Be diligent with your gifts. Aren't you glad somebody was diligent with their gift and put on that barbecue? You may think, how did you just go from talking about hell to a barbecue? Well, I did. Because we're now on the next point. Be diligent with your gifts. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned. Everyone say a long time. And that long time represents that long time that Jesus, our master, has been away. He said, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate. In other words, if you knew I was a ruthless man, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's a scary parable. Jesus would use a ruthless man to give an illustration of what he will be like on the day of judgment. And he says, listen, that lazy servant, throw him into outer darkness. Hell is a place where there is no light. It is dark. And he said there is weeping there. In other words, there is remorse and there is anger, gnashing of teeth. People are frustrated in hell and it goes on forever. You see, live in light of eternity. Live in light of eternity, but we have more to cover, so I won't dwell on that any further. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jesus told another um, important thing about being ready for his coming. Now watch this closely. It says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations, everyone say all the nations. So no one is excluded from this. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Now, in the Stuart Patico translation, it says... I was down, and you sent me a text. You picked up the phone, you called me. Okay, whatever. That was my attempt to introduce some thoughts. But the point is, now, in fact, I'll mention this after I mention the next verse. But before I do, I want you to look at how practical that is. Very practical. And it's really serving, ministering to people's needs. Water, care, invitation, food. Now, it says, then these righteous ones will reply. Now watch this. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. 
When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And we will look at who those brothers and sisters are in a moment. But here's what I want you to notice. They didn't even realize they were doing something that Jesus took so personally. Now, why do I mention that? Listen, especially, we need to hear this, especially in charismatic contexts. We often think of the leading of the Spirit as some special revelation, all right, from the Holy Spirit concerning some big decision we're to make, all right? And yes, of course, God can do that. But please, 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 don't ever think that is God's normal way of leading his people. You want to know what being led by the Spirit looks like? It looks like what Jesus just described. And doing that without any special revelation. Because look, if they had some special revelation from God for each person, listen, Jesus didn't say, hey, when you visited that sick person, you prayed first and got a green light from God to go and visit them. If they had done that, then they would know that they were doing something special. They wouldn't be surprised when Jesus said, hey, when you did that, you did it to me. They wouldn't be surprised. Because, hey, they got some vision from God that they should go and feed that hungry person. But they were surprised. In other words, when they did those things, they were simply acting out of the good nature of their heart. It was so normal for them, they didn't even realize it was special in this way. And that's how we are to be. Listen, don't wait for some special revelation before you serve someone practically. You don't need one. God has already said do it in his word. So do it. That's being led by the Spirit. You're doing what the Spirit wants you to do instead of what your flesh wants you to do because your flesh doesn't want you to do it. Your flesh would rather sit down and watch EastEnders, or whatever it is you watch. I don't know what you watch. EastEnders is an interesting program. I don't watch it, but I watched it one Christmas day, and wow, what a jolly Christmas program it was. Not. But your flesh would rather be chilling, doing something else, and be real with that. Just say, you know what? That's my flesh. My flesh doesn't want to go and serve this person or whatever, but I'm going to go anyway. Practice makes perfect. And begin to build those habits and what you continually, repeatedly do, that's who you become. Now then, Jesus continued. Then it says, then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous will go into eternal life. Strong words from Jesus. Why does he tell us these words? Because he doesn't want us to go into the eternal fire, which he says was prepared for the devil and his demons. So it wasn't even prepared for human beings. It was prepared for the devil. See, some think that in hell you will be tortured by the devil. Let me tell you, listen, the devil himself will be being tortured and his demons. Who are these brothers and sisters? Well, what did Jesus say in Luke 8, 21? My mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and obey it. So it seems, I mean, another view is that it's just talking about humanity in general, but it seems to me that his brothers and sisters are those who follow him. So in other words, when you minister to a fellow believer, and of course, please don't misunderstand me, we are to minister to everyone. But the Bible puts an emphasis in the New Testament. I mean, it says, you know, love all people, especially those who belong to the household of faith. Um, and so there is something, because we are the body of Christ, when we serve another Christian, 
we are serving Christ himself because they are part of his body. Just like if you give my body a drink, you're giving me a drink. And I take that personally because that's for my body. When you serve another believer, part of the body of Christ, Christ takes that personally. But be warned, when you mistreat another believer, he also takes that very personally. And so you should have a healthy fear of mistreating a brother or sister in Christ. And please understand, we're not to mistreat anyone. I'm just emphasizing the way Jesus takes it, especially personal, when you mistreat one of his own. Now, the final way that I want to mention very quickly that we need to prepare ourselves for Christ's coming, to be ready for the day of judgment, is this. We should be merciful to other people. James 2.13 says this, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Now, if that's not motivation to overlook certain transgressions, I don't know what is. Imagine that. You overlook a transgression of someone who has hurt you, and because of that, God shows mercy to you on the day of judgment. In other words, I was about to throw you into the fire, but you showed mercy to that person whom you could have taken revenge on. So you're all right. Come in. Now, how many of you want to build up some good credit um, with mercy? Now, you want that to be credited to your account. Be merciful to others, and God will be merciful to you. So let me summarize this message. We should not allow our frustration about what we can't do cause us to neglect what we can do. We are to prepare for the Lord's return by being holy, diligent with our gifts, loving to others, and merciful. Amen.